Uh, my name is uh, Gene Stark again. Uh, I work for the Joint Program Executive Office for CBRN, CBRN Defense. We are responsible for building and managing CBRN defense capabilities for warfighters. Our mission statement is to protect the joint force from weapons of mass destruction by generating affordable capabilities. There are three commodity areas within the JPO portfolio programs. These include medical, sensors, and protection. And within the JPO CBRND, I work in the area of protection for the joint project manager protection. Our office fields individual protective equipment, collective protection equipment, and hazard mitigation capabilities to US soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Today, I'd like to discuss with you our efforts to identify and procure improved chemical agent resistant coatings, or CART paint as I'll call it, for use on tactical military equipment. The ability of warfighters to operate un unencumbered within chemical biological agent individual protective equipment without IPE as soon as possible following a chemical biological agent attack is of critical importance for our warfighters. To accomplish this, multiple technologies are needed to prepare, respond, and recover from a CB attack. Today, I'd like to talk about what we can do to better prepare for a CB attack. Hazard mitigation preparation technologies that we are developing include coatings, covers, and protective overlays. I'd just like to talk about permanent coatings today, or CART. The, the objective of, of this study, which I'll explain to you uh, over the next 10 minutes, is to identify an improved chemical warfare agent resistant CART paint while minimizing any degradation of camouflage IR signature or corrosion resistance or gloss or color degradation. For certain missions, the services may be willing to accept increased gloss or reduced camouflage or IR signature for enhanced chemical agent resistance, leading to easier decontamination, reduced logistics, and less warfighter fighter burden. New CARC paint formulations provided by vendors will be tested to determine the trade-offs between chemical resistance, corrosion resistance, and gloss signature management. Essentially, what we are trying to accomplish is to develop a Teflon type coating that we can put on our military equipment so that chemical warfare agents will not stick to the equipment, but will simply roll off, as I've shown in this diagram here. And in the end, a simple uh, soapy water rinse could effectively get the equipment ready to use back in fight. But before I explain our study, I would like to provide some background information on cart paint in case you are not too familiar with it. Cart paint is specified for use on tactical military equipment such as aircraft, tactical wheeled vehicles, and ground support equipment. About 1 million gallons of these coatings are produced each year, and our military equipment is repainted with this coating about every five years. These top coats have, a, there are a lot of things that they have to do. There are at least 20 characteristics requirements that must meet. These are captured in the specifications and include camouflage or signature management, protection against corrosion and weather-induced degradation and chemical resistance. In the 1970s, alkyd-based paints were commonly used or oil-based paints. These had the problems in that they did not stand up well to the petroleum oils and lubricants that are on the battlefield. And in the 80s, the military switched to a polyurethane-based coating in order to improve corrosion resistance and to withstand harsh chemicals such as decontamination solution number two, which General King may remember, those of us that have been around a long time, about 20 years ago, this was a decontamination solution in the US military. It's a corrosive solution and it contains, uh, the active ingredient is sodium hydroxide with the organic solvent ethylene glycol, monomethyl ether, and diethyl triamine. Now, sodium hydroxide is used as a drain cleaner and draino, so you know that that's corrosive and not much fun to carry around and put on your shelf when you're going into battle. In the 20s and then in the 2000s, rather, DS2 was replaced with water based decontaminants, including STB. HTH and PAA. Now these STB and HTH are calcium hypochlorite solutions, water-based decontaminants. PAA is per acetic acid, peroxyacetic acid, which is also water-based. These have the advantages of you can carry these as powders onto the battlefield and reconstitute them into a decon solution by adding water. 
So much lower logistics burden. Uh, but there's some issues with that, and I'll talk about that shortly. Today, cart paint is produced by multiple companies that build to a specification. Each manufacturer has their own unique formulation. Current specifications are managed by the Army Research Lab. microscopic image of this green cart. The 64159 is the Army specifications. And you can Google that and you can obtain the specifications yourself. If you want to uh, be a CARC manufacturer, we welcome all new paint companies that can meet the manufacturers, uh, the requirements. So after the primer is, uh, the primer is added next. It's, it's typically an epoxy primer, which is applied via electro deposition. Uh, next, the primer is, well, the primer is especially important for corrosion resistance. Uh, finally, the polyurethane top coat is applied. The top coat provides camouflage and chemical agent resistance. So the challenge that we have is chemical repellency versus chemical resistance. The polyurethane coatings are very chemical resistant. They can withstand, and they're very durable, withstand very harsh chemicals such as DS2 or petroleum lubricants and last and be durable for a long time. But the chemical repellency is the issue and that the uh, polyurethane coatings tend to absorb chemicals and they, they tend to stick in there. And the issue is it's hard to decontaminate them because they present a, a slowly off-gassing and contact hazard. Let me explain that in the next slide in more detail on what are challenges with decontamination. Chemical warfare agents absorb onto porous surfaces such as polyurethanes and may be difficult to decontaminate. This figure explains how the decontamination process works on porous materials. Chemical warfare agents here shown in red will slowly absorb into porous substrates. Water-based decontaminants shown in green can efficiently react and remove chemical warfare agents from the surface but may not be able to penetrate into the porous materials. Consequently, the the CWA remains trapped below the surface. It remains a vapor off-gassing and liquid contact hazard. Since like dissolves likes, as we say as chemists, both harsh organic solvents-based decontaminants may be needed to penetrate into porous materials in order to react and destroy chemical warfare agents from porous materials. This is why DS2 decon, de decon used previously by the US military was such an effective decontaminant. The ideal solution is to develop a coating that doesn't absorb chemical agents, thus reducing the need for harsh chemical decontaminants and speeding up the decontamination process. You probably uh, understand this in your own home if you painted with either semi-gloss and flat paints. You know, semi-gloss paints tend to be easier to clean. You can wipe the fingerprints and the oils off much easier than flat paints. But having a, a glossy paint on the battlefield is not advantageous. So let me go to the next slide and tell you, this is the challenges that we are trying to face. And when we're, solve, when we're looking to solve a problem, I like to write down what the, the issues are and what the problem statement is. And the issues that we wanted to know is if there are improved chemical agent resistant coatings that can still meet the corrosion camouflage and all the other CARC requirement, requirements and also be chemical repellent. Now, if that's not possible, we want to optimize chemical repellency or chemical resistance. I'll use that, those terms interchangeably. What will that cost in terms of camouflage, corrosion, resistance, CONOPS? So this was our, our challenge. And our problem statement is how can we identify coating systems that provide the highest resistivity or repellency to chemical agents and make them available for DOD assets? So this is uh, how we decided to tackle this problem. Uh, this is an overview of the CARC trade space study. We have completed the first two steps on the left. The first thing we did was to invite industry and government paint developers to identify alternative coating systems that will, be, that will significantly reduce chemical agent retention. 
We will consider waving gloss and color restraints if formulations can enhance chemical agent resistivity. In other words, the chemical agent resistance is the independent variable in our study. We'd like to show what the cost trade-off will be for other CART properties in exchange for enhanced chemical resistance. Next step is we shipped panels to coding developers who painted the panels and shipped them back to the government for testing. As of today, we have seen we've received panels back from seven paint vendors. Steps three and four will be done concurrently. New panels will undergo chemical agent resistant testing at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. The Army Research Laboratory will perform the physical properties testing. After testing is complete, a trade space analysis will be done to evaluate the different coating properties. We will ask vendors who supply the best coatings to provide upwards of 55 gallons of material for demonstration where coatings will be applied to military assets to validate application and general coating integrity. Filming of the system will occur by updating the CART performance specifications. Any manufacturer that can meet the new performance specifications will become a qualified manufacturer of the new improved chemical aid resistance paint. Let me go into a little more detail in the next chart on what our testing process is that we've come up with. This chart shows uh, how Army Research Lab, which is manages the CARC specifications, is also managing the testing of this effort. We have three different sizes of panels that we ship to CARC vendors who are participating in the study. They are, they painted the panels and are shipping them back to us. We have almost all of the panels now. We're, we're uh, going to initiate testing this month. Uh, panels were sent to developmental command where they do the chemical and biological agent resistance testing. And they have specific size panels with these frangible coupons where it can test 20, do 24 different replicates with one small panel. Uh, larger panels are sent to the Army Research Lab for the physical properties testing. And then we're also sending uh, large panels and also the small frangible panels to our partners at NASA, where we'll these, uh, these panels will be exposed to the Florida sun at Cape Canaveral. So on the left, just to give you a little background on the chemical agent resistance testing, the, we've developed a new method that we are employing for this test, a new chemical agent resistance method. And it's a three-step process. It involves washing, well, of course, first, of course, applying the agent to the panel, washing the panel with water, and then soaking the panel in soapy water for three seconds, then washing it again, and then measuring the amount of chemical agent that remains on the panel. This is different than the current specification, which involves an isopropanol rinse. And we think this is better representative of measuring chemical repellency. With going to evaluate in color, we're going to put the panels, the panels in the accelerated corrosion testing, uh, salt fog for 1500 hours or about two months. We're also going to do accelerated agent testing by putting the panels into a xenon chamber for about three weeks. And after three weeks, we'll evaluate the color and gloss and those accelerated agent panels will go back to chemical agent resistance testing so we can see if we still have that resistance after this accelerated aging. Uh, the panels will be uh, immersed in fuel for, uh, for a week, in water for a week, to do a visual evaluation to see if they still maintain their color and gloss. We're going to put the panels in super tropical be bleach, which is calcium hypochlorite, for 30 minutes, and also measure the adhesion. So that's our, our overall testing strategy. We when we started this effort, we reached out to existing CARC vendors, and there are about nine of them. And we uh, received a very positive response from them. We, seven vendors are participating in the study. And are, uh, many of them say they have products that are on their shelf that they think could meet our specifications, or at least be improvement over the existing CARC. Uh, and, and so each of them wanted to send multiple samples to us. So we have over 30 different coatings. The government is doing the testing at the government expense and the vendors get the information, they get free testing out of it. While the government, we get an understanding of what the current state of the art is 
of chemical resistant coatings. So here's the being out in the Florida sun, we're going to send those back to the chem lab for the agent resistance testing. And after that, we're going to do our trade space analysis to identify which ones are the most productive. Ideally, we'd like a solution that's that meets all the current CARC specifications, but is also chemical resistant. But this may not be possible. We'll do our analysis and we'll see, well, if we want chemical resistance, what's going to be the cost in terms of other properties that are not up to current specifications. We'll present that to uh, the users and they'll let us know if this is something that they think is useful for certain battlefield conditions, if there is a trade off that is required. And we're in contact with uh, the Striker Vehicle Program Manager, which is part of the ground combat system. And we also work closely with Marine Corps Systems Command to uh, apply these codings to their equipment. So finally, uh, talking to uh, warfighters, uh, a colleague of mine was in Iraq and uh, he was on his way to Baghdad. And this is a, a new type of coating that he thought would be useful. If you could have a, a coating that was more chemical resistant, but yet was a little bit more gloss, that would be a trade-off that'd be acceptable because we knew that Iraq had chemical agents and they could use them. This would give the user confidence that their, their equipment could be easily cleaned, easily decontaminated, they could get back in the fight. You can also see how this an improved CARC paint formulation could be used in future combat situations. Uh, Syria comes to mind. We know they have chemical agents. If we were willing to, the user is willing to accept a little higher gloss for enhanced chemical resistance, then that may be a, an appropriate place for that uh, technology to be used. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Sure, thank you. And uh, for the audience, when we talk about protection from this perspective, you focus really on CARC and that's a coating, but you also focus on coverings and protective overlays and other means. And so it's a multifaceted strategy to try to provide protection uh, both continuously and as needed should a threat present itself. Is that, is that a good way of describing it, sir? Yes, yes, well said. Okay, hey, historically, it's always been a challenge to identify cart coatings, particularly with repaintings, whether people have repainted with the proper cart or where they repainted with just regular paint. Uh, what measures are in place now to ensure that field deployed vehicles do not have cart coating compromises on them already? Well, there is a program manager that is responsible for CARC, uh, and so paint, the, the user does not apply the coating CARC in the field. It's done at the depot level under very controlled conditions. And I, I put that in the slide, the person in charge of that, of, of painting the coatings is the P, PDM vehicle protection systems. Well, so thank that, you, that's, that's, I appreciate that. And there's a lot of people out there that are wanting to know how What's the process procedures for commercial paint manufacturers to participate in your in your program if they haven't already done so? And, I, and you described a system that's well underway. Uh, so I guess you know, one comment I would offer is, is uh, after your presentation, if you can provide contact information, because there may be some others out there that would like to follow up conversation with you about where and if there's still a chance for them to, to jump into this process and assist. Uh, your, yes. test, your test strategy seems multifaceted. What are the shortcomings in your process from your perspective? Where, where are we assuming some risk? And then how do we keep communication channels open and transparent in that process? So what are the, what are the, challenge, what are the risks with our testing process? Uh, well, uh, we have, we, I think we have a pretty uh, thorough process here. Uh, I think the, the risks are with the samples that are at, at NASA, it, it's possible if we don't take good care of them, they can be lost in an upcoming hurricane. But we, we do have people that are looking closely after our panels out there. Um, 
these these tests are all very uh, well known. Uh, the the test is low risk, so I, I think we're really have a low risk test strategy here. The, the challenge will be how we're going to do the analysis. How we're going to what we are going to use is the uh, the benchmark of what's what's acceptable. Even though we because we we are not using the old specifications, we are doing that analysis. So I think the challenge is really going to be in the analysis. No, I agree. And that leads right into what technological innovation should be available in the, on the security marketplace in order for JPE or Kimbao Defense to conduct appropriate tests more effectively, uh, both now and in the future. And I'm familiar with the infrastructure that you and I are both familiar with with Dugway and with CBC, but given we're technologists today, AI, ML are examples. Are there ways, new ways of thinking about it and maybe changing how we've been doing it from the past? Uh, so the question is about test methodology and what we might need to do differently in the future. Correct, uh, okay. and it may be the data analytics afterwards. You know, the the, the test itself may be the, the very simple and very easy. Maybe the the real question is is how can we become more efficient and more effective in our uh, data analytics from those tests. Uh, it seems to me that the biggest weakness of our test is of, of our strategy is we don't necessarily have a whole system test to evaluate all the different capabilities at once. So ideally, we'd like to uh, put a military vehicle out somewhere in Dugway and be able to apply actual chemical agent on it and then use the technology that we have to see uh, how it works. And, and measure under those real life conditions. But that's uh, that's something that's we don't currently do right now. We do the little components and we try to integrate those in together into the analysis. But a whole system level test, I think, is, with actual agent would be uh, very helpful. Yeah. And so our last question for you, and it may be just a little bit outside of your area of responsibility, but I think you're definitely an expert to be able to talk to it, is today we rely heavily on soap and water lots of it to dilute and wash away contamination. Whereas you mentioned in your presentation, for some of us old timers, we, you know, we grew up with STB and DS2 and some very caustic materials to force a chemical reaction on the surface, basically strip away any contamination. Um, is there any efforts to testing and evaluate how those previous decontaminants that we're not using them today are effective? are as effective with some, against some of these coatings? And is there a, a desire or an interest to go back to using some of those more aggressive uh, decontaminants as part of that process? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, yes, we have tested some of those for harsh decontaminants, which contain the organic solvents and they work very well. Uh, at the same time, our users don't want to have to carry these caustic solutions out on the battlefield. So there's a trade-off there. Are they willing to accept maybe slightly uh, less efficient decontaminant for uh, reduced logistic burdens? Um, and the answer has been yes to that. Um, and so yeah, that, that, that's a tough question for the user to, to decide. I think for some of our fixed site facilities, I'm thinking Air Force A pods, uh, C pods, places where you're not having to haul stuff around that you can store it, maybe that's more efficient and effective using some of these more aggressive, uh, more caustic, but more aggressive decontaminants versus some of our mobile forces, our light forces that do have a concern about the heavy logistics burden of hauling stuff around. Maybe that is not as effective. So maybe we have to think about this in a dual, dual approach perspective. But I think that's why coatings and protective uh, over, overlays and and uh, coverings are critically important, particularly for those light mobile forces, things that you could peel off contamination and continue your mission without having to rely upon, one, a heavy water uh, requirement, and two, uh, this heavy logistics uh, burden of, of hauling decontaminants around. Yeah, you, that, we are looking into that as well. We are looking into temporary coatings that you could put on right before you go on the mission so you can get by with uh, simpler water-based decontaminants efficiently. So yeah, we, I, I, we, I think it's important to realize that there are many approaches that need to be taken here. Uh, there's not just one solution that's going to meet all solve all of the problems. It's uh, hazard mitigation is complicated. Sir, so absolutely. Uh, you're not a stranger to this forum, so I thank you for returning back and uh, continuing to stir the pot. 
uh, forcing us to think outside the box and ask questions, quite frankly, that, that some might want to avoid because they're, they're hard questions. And maybe there's not a clear answer today, but they're things that we need to be thinking about and keeping in the back of our mind. Uh, this whole idea of you know, using uh, caustic materials, environmentally unsafe materials, maybe there is a, a cost benefit analysis for some of that. And maybe we can do things differently today that we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago to handle the contamination controls of using those materials. But again, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for your presentation. And I ask you to stick around. And like I said, there's probably a half a dozen more questions that I just couldn't wrap into for the short period of time. So I'd ask you to go look at the chat function in the forum itself. And if you will, answer those questions that you feel you can uh, provide some feedback to. And stick around. I think you'll have a fantastic day of discussions. Okay, thank you.